This episode of the Jeep Talk Show is brought to you by Realtruck.com. With over 1 million plus parts and accessories for your Jeep, truck, and life. Uh, more later on Real Truck's latest off-road trail repair at Easter Jeep Safari 2024. You guys have heard of uh, EJS, right? A mm, couple times. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tony, and welcome to the Jeep Talk Show, the premier show for Jeep enthusiasts and hardcore off-roaders. Whether you're new to the Jeep world or a seasoned Jeeper, we've got you covered with the latest news, tips, and advice to help you get the most out of your Jeep. Well, howdy, it's Wendy, and it's part two of using a spotter and those verbal commands you might hear. <laughs> Hi, I'm Larry, and if you're at the Moore Overlanding Expo, stop by. I'll be in the Hella Lighting booth. And uh, say hi and maybe get a sticker. And uh, wear your sunglasses. Uh, I would think that they're going to have uh, some examples of high beam <laughs> light. <laughs> All right. So this is a bit of a, uh, uh, I guess, an internal perspective or something. Um, I'm curious uh, of both of you why you have a Jeep. Why did you go with a Jeep? You know, there are other off-road capable vehicles. Some people are gasping because they didn't realize this, but there are <laughs> other off-road capable vehicles out there. Why did you pick a Jeep? Uh, when do you go first? Um, partly because Bill had an experience with his mom who had a Jeep. I think she had a little TJ and they camped a lot and did stuff. So he wanted to get a Jeep to get back into it. I had no clue. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I didn't even probably realize there were off-road vehicles. Um, until I met Bill. Uh, so that would be why we ended up with the Jeep. And for me personally, I can't imagine not owning a Jeep and or why would I have any other off-road vehicle? I don't think there is capable. Um, so I personally wouldn't even recommend any other off-road vehicle. So there you go. Yeah. Larry, what about you? Why a Jeep? And in yours, you're, you are relatively new to the Jeep world, right? Because this, uh, this, uh, uh, JLU that you have is your first Jeep. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's the first one. Well, you know, looking for something that's capable. Ben Scour wasn't in the budget or a deuce and a half. <laughs> so, uh, you know, every, it seemed like that's what everybody was using. And uh, so I just kind of went with the, went with the uh, with crew, if you will. And, uh, well, been all uphill since then. So, Wendy, you, you, uh, you uh, really, Bill chose the Jeep, and then you learned about off-roading, so it makes sense. So you kind of had a family connection. Uh, mm -hmm. for the Jeep. And that's happened to some people like Chuck, for example, his, his parents yeah. were big time Jeepers on the Rubicon. So it's, it's uh, absolutely understandable why he would continue with the Jeep. Uh, I mean, it's not like it's a bad decision, but, um, sometimes people like going with something else that isn't the popular thing, you know, they sure. want to do it their own way. Now yeah. you're, I think you're in a, a relatively unique position here that you've actually, uh, since you're a spotter and you work with uh, Don Alexander, uh, and uh, show people how to do off-road stuff that you, you don't, uh, it, it's not just Jeeps that you, uh, people in Jeeps that you train. Correct. Yeah, we do vehicles, trucks, vehicles. Yeah, of course they're vehicles. We do trucks. We've done, um, I don't know, give me any kind of a well, vehicle. We've Rivian, for example. You, Rivian. Yeah. We've done the 4XEs. We've done Toyotas. Toyotas. Uh, how about Ford Subarus? Trucks. How about Subarus? You ever had any we Subarus out there? Yep, we have. So those are all capable vehicles, and for what they're doing, they're awesome. But me personally, I would just stick with the Jeep because it's so capable to do multiple things with the Jeep. So would you say that it is uh, that uh, out of all those other vehicles you've seen, and maybe you've even driven a few uh, mm -hmm. off-road, that a uh, Jeep is significantly better or significantly uh, more likely to succeed uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I just want to know. I'm trying to understand uh, and trying to get the listener to understand why Jeep, why you guys went with Jeep. Yeah, it's definitely more capable for more things. So obviously a, a truck is maybe limited by its ability for clearance. Mm -hmm. But yet we've seen very capable Toyos out there, very capable trucks that can do, you know, obstacles like John Bull. Um, but for being able to do everything like on the highway, you know, um, do any kind of trail from Black Diamond on down to easy camping, even towing Jeep just offers all of those varieties of being able to do that. So a truck might have to be lifted. It may not work as well on the road to do everyday driving. I don't know, mm -hmm. but for me, everything that I've seen, yeah, it's kind of, you know, you're going to be limited on other vehicles. The Jeep just offers so much more. 
possibilities. Mm-hmm. Larry, have you had any experience with any other off-road vehicles besides the Jeep that you have? Yeah, the only other one I've had is I had a rail buggy, but it wasn't made for rock climbing per se, more right. for sand and trails and stuff like that. No, uh, no rocks or anything like that. So no, so the Jeep I have is the first one I've uh, ever been out on the rocks with. Oh, and uh, you forgot the most important reason uh, for the rail buggy, uh, getting chicks. Because those are really cool, and they, hey, hey come on, can I have a ride? Oh, sure, honey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the the one with the VW engine in the back, right? Because those things were oh, yeah. real popular way back when. They, they were really cool, but they were two-wheel but, drive. But oh, even yeah. that kind of off-road, like what he was doing, and we do quads and, you know, motorcycles and different stuff, you can't, you can only do off-road. The Jeep offers everyday driving, it offers highway, it offers going and traveling and seeing this whole entire country, mm-hmm. and then, oh, by the way, I can go off-road and see even more. So, to me, I think the Jeep really does sort of offer every possible option. So, yeah, my- so would you guys say it's like the Swiss Army knife of off-road vehicles? Yeah. yeah. Or not necessarily right. off-road vehicles, just vehicles. Yes, right. I would. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because very few vehicles, you could go beat on it all weekend. And then drive it, you know, home a thousand miles and, well, maybe you just blew a brake line and it was it. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, it's very versatile. So uh, I know that our audience are Jeepers, but we do have people that are listening to the show uh, that uh, haven't purchased a Jeep. Uh, and maybe they're thinking about getting a Bronco or a Toyota or uh, something other, some off-road, off-road vehicle other than Jeep. And I Mm -hmm. think there's a a fair amount. And I like being unique as well. I I just don't like being stupid unique. (laughs) So if if you're going with something else just because you want to be unique, uh, you may be traveling a a harder road than what you have to, uh, so to speak. Well, I think it's also we go back to talking about to people about what do you going to what are you going to do? Right. You know, if you're just going to do some basic roads or you're going to be all in the desert sand, if you're going to be you know, thrashing on the rocks and you got to decide what vehicle works. There's a lot of capable trucks that are set up that do great stuff in the desert, uh, basic rocks climbing and all that stuff. And maybe they're not good for a daily driver, but that's okay for those people. You know, that's what they want to do. Um, maybe a Subaru works for you because you, you know, you're commuting all the time and you want to get off on the road sometimes, but you don't have the clearance to do a lot of the rock climbing. But I've seen some Subarus set up where they can do some pretty awesome rock climbing. So I think it goes back to what do you want to do in your off-road world or in your camping or overlanding or whatever, and you pick that vehicle that works best for what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my only caveat to that would be is, you know, you're by, you buy a vehicle, and it's, oh, I just, I just want to do some light trails or just maybe some <laughs> yeah. camping. Before, before you get but, bit, yeah. Yeah, but, before you, you know, get hooked. All of, all of your buddies are going out on these really epic trips all mm-hmm. weekend long but i doubt that i'll ever get there I'll yeah by this Oops. for now <laughs> and then you're at the dealership you know not quite a year later trying to unload that thing so i can buy something else right i can do well, and i don't mean to pick on the renegade uh, the modern day renegade uh, uh, owners but this is the, this is what my problem with uh, people buying uh, renegades or i think to a lesser degree compasses because i don't think anybody thinks a compass a, a jeep compass is an off-road vehicle i don't um, think so and I, and I don't know what the aftermarket is like for those other brands, but certainly uh, the Jeep Renegade, the aftermarket uh, is not really, there's not as big an aftermarket as there is for the Wrangler and the Gladiator. Uh, and uh, I, I, would, I would suspect that the Subaru aftermarket isn't nearly as big as Jeep. And, uh, and I think that the Ford Bronco market aftermarket is growing, uh, certainly for tie rod ends. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but I don't think that it is as big as it is for Jeep. So mm-hmm. uh, I think that not only is the Jeep more capable off road, on road, uh, and all, all things for for all people, but it's also a, a great platform to have for modifications, mm-hmm. uh, bolt on modifications, uh, which is which means uh, cheaper and easier to install and cheaper to install. Yeah, and from what I understand, men love the bolt ons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say it, Wendy. I knew it. I think, <laughs> Look I think at that. You, I actually I think got you. Tony to be speechless? I, no, wow. no, I'm not. I'm just being, trying to be uh, polite. <laughs> where's Where's the drum sound sound effect? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I had to go there. You, you started. I had to go there. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we think, obviously, Jeep is the, the best uh, vehicle to go with. 
Uh, and uh, but you know you should do you whatever it is that you want to do uh, that, exactly. that's fine and you can learn the hard way like I mean, some of us <laughs> us have and, and and when I say learn the hard way it's not like I didn't go with a Jeep uh, but it's like modifications like when you go well I don't need anything more than a four inch lift or I don't need anything more than a two inch lift and then like Larry was talking about uh, you, you you wind up having to do buy another lift because you learn <laughs> what you're going with so. Uh, and that's one of the things we like to do here on the show is give you an idea of what you may be in for uh, and maybe save you some money in the long run. You know, go ahead and go with that larger lift. Go ahead and go with that larger tire. Uh, bigger tires, yeah. But, but we want you to be informed about uh, you can't just go with bigger tires because there's other things that you have to do to, mm-hmm. to make that a reality. Uh, and especially if you're going to go off-road, uh, you may not want to be putting a, a, a 40s on a Dana 30, for example. And oh, no. uh, Yeah. Because uh, it's your next upgrade. Because it, 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 <laughs> it does. Yeah, puts it, that to the top of the list. It will break. <laughs> it, it, it may be. It may break to sitting in the garage because that's, that's a lot right. of tire for a Dana thirty. <laughs> uh, and, and you otherwise wouldn't know about this. We all had to learn this uh, when we got into jeeping. So hopefully yeah. we're we're saving you some time and money. All right, on tonight's episode in our news stories, new CEO of Stellantis is going to double volume. So Ooh, I, is, I this isn't like he's volume. yeah it's not like he's turning it up to eleven or anything he he wants to <laughs> to double the uh, amount of sales of jeeps which sounds great yeah uh, I like uh, it. but I don't know how he's going to do that with interest rates because I think interest rates are really killing the the sales right now I wouldn't get one mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> what is that uh, not FIFO what's it called uh, Bo- Bogo? Bogo. Yeah, yeah Bogo. Bogo. Is, is Bogo still a thing? I remember when I the so. when my daughters and my wife were saying that a couple of years ago. Maybe longer than that. Uh, in Newbie Nuggets, Wendy continues to share how to use a spotter and in a legal, friendly way. Yes. So, <laughs> Fabricating Frenzy with Larry, uh, do you like to repair your stuff? Uh, no, but yes. <laughs> Like when it's done, <laughs> and, oh, yeah, and it works. <laughs> Technicalities there. Yeah, and if in your must-have stuff for your Jeep, a mount, a high lift mount for your Gladiator high lift. Larry, where would you think you would put? And maybe you already know the answer to this. But where do you, where would you put a high lift on a Gladiator? I would think on a, on the uh, rails of the bed. Yeah, I would go inside on mm-hmm. the bed. Yeah, because you really, I mean, you could put it on the, on the side door because I think you can still use those ones like they have for the JLs to mount the high lift on the side of your Jeep. Uh, or the, 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 I think the worst place to put a high lift jack is on the hood, you know, where you mount that thing oh, on the yeah. hood. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, I mean, especially, I mean, if you're, if you're six foot or five uh, ten or something like that, or maybe you got a stool that you can use to get to it, yeah, depending on the size of the lift. Uh, and it's not like it's super heavy, but it's long and it has some weight to it. So how many times are you going to hit the hood while you're taking that yeah. thing off? Yeah. And at what angle and everything else that's going on. So uh, I think it has to be in a good location for you to be able to get to it. Uh, and uh, also, too, I think several people have told me high lift jacks are dangerous uh, when they're not out in the weather. <laughs> <laughs> you, you keep them out in the weather, then they, they really get dangerous. They so, can be dangerous, yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, the, we're, we're going to talk about a, a, a trail, a Mopar trail rail uh, mount kit uh, for the the high lift jack, uh, which is what I'm using on uh, the 2021 Jeep Talk Show Gladiator. Are you ready? It's time for the Jeep Talk Show with hosts Tony, Josh, Wendy, and Chuck. All righty, so uh, the the new Jeep CEO, Stellantis, you know, I guess it's Jeep CEO, says that he's going to double sales volume. That's his goal. What do you guys think? You think it's possible? I think it's good to have goals. Oh, you have to. Yeah, absolutely, you have exactly. to. It's right out of the consultant playbook. Yeah, especially, <laughs> especially when you get a new job. Yep, I can do that. So uh, I think we've talked about this gentleman before. Uh, Jeep's new CEO, Antono, uh, Anton, Anton, blah, 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 Antonio Filosa. Does that sound right to you guys? Filosia? He's Look, never coming on the show now. You butcher. Looks right. Name. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's not like I'm picking on him. I can't pronounce anybody's name. <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky I can pronounce Bob. So he took the helm in November with a mandate to overhaul Stellantis off-road brand. My God. Hmm. Can you imagine overhauling the Jeep, the off-road Jeep, I mean, that's dangerous. 
I don't uh, think it's a problem in the states. I don't think our that brand is needed to be overhauled, but maybe it does. Who knows? Well, in the the, the article goes on to say uh, the off road brand, which has lost market share in Europe, no surprise there, and critically, its biggest market, the U.S. So is it because the trails are being closed everywhere and there's less to do off road? I'm going to guess it has to do <laughs> with the electrification of Jeeps. Oh, of course, yeah, that yeah. Could it be the three ninety two costs a hundred thousand dollars? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, they're all very expensive, aren't they? Oh yeah. I, I mean, uh, the, and and I think that's one of the reasons with the interest rates being higher than what they've been. Uh, and and if you if you lived in the eighties, this these interest rates are nothing. <laughs> but that must be true. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be horrific for it to keep people from buying things um and uh, i think that's what uh, why one of the reasons why the gladiators uh or prices are down you know larry i don't i think you decided not to go with a gladiator but have you still right. been looking at prices for gladiators you know I, I still get the emails and i had put it in a in the chat group the other day one a mojave came through brand new it was in florida 35 and change oh my god that's a great price that's at that least yeah. that, that, that might be ten thousand dollars less than what i paid for my sport ass mm-hmm. yeah obviously well, um, a really nice rig too it is uh well the problem i've always had with it and this is a rabbit hole the problem i've always had with it is <laughs> it's a it's an off-road like high speed desert type thing which it's not ifs it's it's not i mean to each their own, but if I'm on a if I want a Jeep, I do not want something for high speed off road. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it, that's that's an IFS you know type sit, setup, and yeah, uh, it, it's nice. I mean, it, and you do have a locker in the rear, if I remember that correctly. Yep. Yeah. So the, knuckles, all the good stuff. Yeah, and it's pretty, especially the orange one. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, so the, obviously this guy is coming in, and he has a mandate. You and you have to wonder how long he's going to be there. Uh, if he's not successful with this. But uh, Filosa uh, comes t- uh, to Jeep from uh, top post in Latin America, where he helped to make the reg- region success a success story for Fiat Chrysler automobiles and then later Stellantis. So he is he does um, he has uh, succeeded in Latin America. Um, I don't know that the problems that they were having back then, are the same problems they're having now, though. I think mm-hmm. the problems they're having now are different. Like Larry, you said, the cost of these these Jeeps are, is very right. high. Well, you figure, you know, it, Latin America. All I, I envision, you know, Fiat 500s, little cars that mm-hmm. you know they're not as expensive, and it's a, it's a total different economy. But if you if you enjoy your Jeep, I mean, you're in for I'm going to call it almost forty grand plus upgrades. Right, and the right. upgrades can be uh, can easily be half of that. Oh yeah. So uh, Filosa has a clear vision for Jeep Stellantis. Uh, most global uh, brand has become to uh, even more global, adding in a, and I, I and that's fine. I kind of see that as a downside because I don't need a Jeep that's uh, uh, beloved in Europe. I, I need one that is an American uh, Jeep. It started out as American vehicle. And I think that's where the focus needs to be. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Uh, adding Jeep prod, pro, uh, products to the group plans in markets where local production uh, would give a cost uh, advantage. So this kind of sounds like they're they're looking at uh, uh, building Jeeps uh, other than in the the U.S., um, mm-hmm. which is which potentially could hurt uh, people in Toledo. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know anything. I didn't read anything about that in here. But if they're looking at building them uh, in the the countries where they don't have to ship them. Uh, or they they ship them a, a shorter distance, then that certainly makes it uh, easier for them to make profit on those, and it, and it does make sense. But uh, I I don't want a China Jeep, uh, I don't want a French Jeep. I mean, just the nope. cigarette smoke alone, I, I would not like the smell of those Jeeps. <laughs> All the people in France stopped listening to the show just now. Exactly, they went. That's it. You We're know, done. You know, one thing would be nice if you could if you could a la carte a Jeep. Right, because you know the sport, or even just a plain old sport, yeah, you can buy that for the low thirties. Mm-hmm. But I mean, and you can go do things with it. But you know, if you want Dana forty four front and rear, and you want lockers, I mean, if you could go through an a la carte instead of having to buy this package or that package, it might be more attractive to people who want to have a platform to start with the on their build. Mm-hmm. 
I, I remember I remember uh, somebody uh, asking uh, Jim Morrison when we had him on the show uh, man, a couple of years ago now, uh, not two years, but a while back, and they asked him about uh, you know how could we just order what we wanted on there and like instead of having to buy a Rubicon, I want right. the lockers, I want the heavier duty axles, but I want lockers in them. Why can't I just order uh, like a sport with lockers? And, right. And, and 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 I remember Jim saying something along the lines of. Uh, it makes it a lot uh, more difficult to actually build the vehicles that way. It takes them more time, and uh, certainly that it would require uh, more people checking to make sure the right Jeep is being built. I mean, mm-hmm. as as it is right now, that they build X and X number of Rubicons, X number of Sports, X number of whatever, uh, based on uh, where sales are going. So I can see how it would be easier and actually could lower the cost uh, for them. Um, so a-, a la carte may actually increase the prices. If not that, just come up with a, a builder's model, if you will, right? Which is just like a, a, a Sport S with lockers, four-to-one transfer case. We'll call it a builder's kit or whatever. And other than that, it's just stripped down. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's, there's always ways. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and who's to, who's to say that this isn't part of the plan? It, it very well could be. We don't know yet. Who knows? Exactly. Mm-hmm. So uh, this is the part I like the best, and I suspect you guys are uh, going to like as well. Jeep will also keep a pragmatic approach to electrification. Pragmatic. Mm-hmm. What does pra- ba- pragmatic make, uh, make to you? It, to me, it means a sensible approach, a logical mm-hmm. approach. Yeah, that's what I would think. Yeah. So uh, it's next uh, two crucial new models, the Wagoneer S and Recon midsize SUVs will launch globally as electric only. But uh, uh, this gentleman goes on to say, but opportunities for ICE variants could appear. Hmm. So we may have somebody uh, that thinks the, the way we do that's now in charge of Jeep. That because, would be cool. <laughs> yeah, because he's not saying it's going to be all electric. He's saying, but these vehicles may be ICE vehicles. So people that you know need to drive further than 250 miles and then start panicking because they can't find a charger. Don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, but but you know all all of the auto manufacturers are all complaining that people are not buying the electric vehicles like they no, thought they would. They don't want to. So, it costs too much. Range you, anxiety. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean you can as a, as a government, if you will, you can try to dictate how everything's going to be built, but you can't dictate what you're going to buy unless you make everybody turn in their vehicles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, it just it makes me nervous because <laughs> with all we've seen in the last uh, several years, uh, that's always a possibility too. <laughs> um, so anyway, Filoso uh, it, 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 uh, uh, goes on to say, uh, for, as far as the ice variants, if we don't grab those, somebody else will. So somebody's going to be d- making ice vehicles. Uh, you may not be able to buy them in California. I wonder if they'll actually outlaw uh, internal combustion engines in California I, altogether. I'll be screwed because I'm not, you know, who who can afford that? That's the problem. You yeah. know, with the interest rates the way they are, there's no way I could get out of my vehicles and do that. It doesn't matter if you can afford it or not. I mean, uh, Wendy, I mean, you know that they, what was it, on April Fool's Day? Maybe not, but I, I like to say that. On April Fool's Day, all uh, fast food workers uh, got a raise to $20 an hour. That's and it's not an April Fool's joke. So now these fast food restaurants are closing or going full automation and firing all their employees. <laughs> yeah, right. it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. It's so funny. And, I'm telling you, who's going to pay for that? It's going to increase yeah. our cost to go to uh, darn McDonald's. I'm telling you, it. these stupid uh, politicians <laughs> cannot play chess. They are playing checkers and poorly. Uh, and well, I've said it before. I think some some of them would lose in a a one player game of tic tac toe. But, you know, how, how to get rid of small business. That's what you did. And well, those small businesses help people to get a job to start, maybe while they're through college or they're getting a degree or they're going on to whatever they're going to do. It's impossible to compete. And what's to say other companies aren't going to say, well, I'm an employee. They got $20, you know, schlepping hamburgers at McDonald's. I want $20 an hour to do my job. Yeah. You I know, mean, it's, it's, it's going to be awful, so... The, the mandating your the vehicles to be 100% electric, right. you know, by a certain date is all front page stuff. Yes. They, they never pull out page 35 when they walk it back. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, right. that, that's the oldest one in the book. They walk back on later, later you know, pages, and no one ever goes back and reads those. I think the biggest downside, and I know that you, you should pay attention and you should listen, uh, but I, I, the, I think the biggest downfall for the American public is actually listening to a politician speak. <laughs> because it's, it's crap. It is absolutely 100% crap. They're, well, they're most of them lie, and yeah. they've convinced no. themselves it's the truth. And then the people follow it going, that has to be the truth. Well, you know, one of our greatest presidents said, one of the worst things you can ever hear is, I'm yeah. with the government and I'm here to help. That's right. <laughs> I'm with the government and that. I'm here to help. What a know, that guy was hilarious. Uh, yeah. he, he was a kinder, kinder gentler Trump, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I like to say, because he wasn't a troll <laughs> like yeah. Trump is. No, <laughs> but yeah, he was a lot of fun. I had no idea that he would be uh, such a good president uh, as he was. But he had his, he had his issues as well. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they all do because politicians have to play a game. They have to tell people what they want to hear so they can remain in power. Um, and, uh, I, I just, uh, I don't like the idea of a King unless I'm the King and then, then it would be fine. I would just make all the, the best decisions. Uh, <laughs> and I would accept Jeeps to help influence me. Um, so you might be wondering, uh, well, okay, Jeep is having a hard time selling, uh, selling their vehicles, but, uh, I suspect other manufacturers are as well. And you probably have heard, heard about it, but I thought everybody would like to know that Ford Bronco sales have been down 25.8% in 2024. Hmm. That's, that's a lot. It is a lot. Uh, now it, 2024 is not over, uh, and it could go up, but I don't think so. And I, and again, I think it has a lot to do with the, uh, the concern over the economy, the inflation, uh, rampant inflation and, uh, the, uh, uh, the interest rates being high. So this may be a way to increase the volume of Jeeps. Now, Drastically lowering the price of the Jeeps certainly would uh, could I wouldn't say would but I, I suspect it would uh, uh, help uh, increase the volumes. But what about if uh, Stellantis Jeep was coming out with a tiny Jeep, or they came out with zero percent financing? <laughs> oh yeah, they there always you go. they always get you on that though. They they yeah, increase the it price. Sounds up, it sounds, sounds good, good and gets people started. Yeah, that's right. You got to look at the numbers for that. So no, no there's there's that. been some uh, some talk, and we've mentioned it here on the show a few times uh, about a tiny Jeep that looks just like a Wrangler, except it's shorter. Uh, the, it's basically the the um, uh, is it shortcut? I think it was called shortcut in 2016. The Jeep Con uh, Eastern Jeep Safari concept vehicle. Mm -hmm. It is a very capable four wheel drive. Dana 44s front and rear, uh, open open. In other words, no lockers, uh, no doors, uh, no top. Uh, with a uh, 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 the 3.6 uh, liter engine in it, and it is a it really goes back to more of a uh, a Willys uh, or Willis uh, Jeep. Uh, or uh, maybe even a uh, Mahindra. I would say Roxor. <laughs> yeah. So, although I think the Roxor is actually bigger than uh, than what this Jeep is, and uh, the rumor is, is that it would be in the uh, twelve to fifteen thousand dollar price range. Hmm. So you could get a no frills, all very capable off road vehicle. Uh, and uh, for uh, let's say fifteen, let's say twenty, uh, maybe maybe twenty twenty five. So, uh, you know, $10,000 cheaper than a full-size Jeep. And I think the aftermarket would go wild on these things. And you could see uh, very small, nimble, uh, very capable off-road uh, Wranglers. Uh, and I think they're all going to be red. Uh, don't quote me on that. But I think <laughs> the ones I saw were red. Uh, and that, and that's, that's a winner right there. So, uh, it, and if that happens, uh, and I've mentioned this before, that's going to really hurt Bronco sales, mm -hmm. and it's going to hurt the side by side sales. Yeah, I think there's your big your big competition right there on a smaller version of side by sides, mm -hmm. and and significantly cheaper than the <laughs> side by side, which yeah. it, it amazes me that anybody would spend that much money forty, fifty, eighty thousand dollars on a side by side. I don't see the sense in it, but you know, it's it's all what you like to do. Um, but uh, yeah, so. 
it's I don't know. I, I'm just guessing here. But what if they came out with a mini, a tiny Jeep? I don't want to say mini Jeep because the, there are mini Jeeps out there, but uh, that, that aren't from Stellantis. Um, a, a tiny Jeep that's cheaper and and is definitely 100% a off-road Jeep uh, vehicle. You can look at it and just tell that it is. And uh, that way, people could still buy the big Jeeps if they wanted to. But it would certainly increase volumes because whenever he doubles volumes, he didn't say double profits. He just said double volume. Correct. Hmm. It'll be interesting. Yeah, it's yes. gonna be it's gonna be fun. All right, so we want to talk about Real Trucks EJS 3D Hill project uh, with Tread Lightly. Now, I was confused by this. Whatever I was looking this up, uh, I don't know if you guys had a chance to to look at this story from uh, Real Truck Real Truck dot com uh, slash blog. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the this is Tread Lightly out at EJS. Real Truck was there. Uh, I mean, I saw Greg Henderson. I saw uh, Charlotte uh, with Ladies Off Road Network. Uh, Charlene. Charlene. I'm sorry. And uh, she's going to beat me up next time she sees me. She is. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, of course, Matt uh, with uh, uh, Tread Lightly was there uh, in the pictures that I saw in this article. Uh, but it wasn't the Tread Lightly event that all those same people were at with uh, the the Jeep Talk Show team that went on uh, Monday morning to a Tread Lightly event. I'm wondering if this that maybe happened before, uh, like on a, a, the Saturday or Sunday before. Uh, but they were definitely out there. They were at 3D Hill, and they were building fences. Uh, Larry, you, did, you were at the, the Tread Lightly event last year, weren't you? Yes. They yeah, were building the little fences around the, the dinosaur footprints. Yeah, it was neat to be able to see that, too. Um, so uh, during the 2024 uh, Eastern Jeep Safari, Real Truck had a unique opportunity to join the Tread Lightly team in Moab, Utah, and see firsthand how they maintain and protect some of the most beautiful spots in the valley. And the cool thing is, is that you it doesn't keep you from seeing it. It just keeps you from uh, <laughs> walking on stuff that you shouldn't be walking on. Yeah, and you know, the big thing there is you don't want to give the other groups the ammunition or the power to say, see, that's why we need to shut this down. Right. Right, which is, which is one of the big things about Tread Lightly. You know, it's trying to preser- preserve the landscape and the environment so that, you know, we can continue to be out there and not give the other groups the firepower to say, see, this is why. Yeah. We need, yeah. We this need is, to kick all, everybody out. This is why we can't have nice things. Yeah. I, yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, and, which is their ultimate goal. I don't think that they're being, some of them I'm sure are, but I don't think they're being genuine about uh, protecting, uh, uh, sharing, I should say, not protecting, but sharing the, the, the earth with everybody. They just want to keep us off. Uh, and and that also oh, yeah. includes hikers and bikers and motorcycle riders oh, and every, they want everybody off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. and that's a shame. And I don't think that's that's fair uh, for a small group of people to do that. And Tread Lightly helps uh, keep that from happening. So Tread Lightly, based in North Salt Lake, Utah, was initially launched by the United States Forestry Service in 1985 as a campaign to mitigate the impacts of off-road vehicles. By 1990, it had evol- uh, evolved into a nonprofit entity supporting, uh, supported by member, uh, members and industry partners like Real Truck. And I just think it's really important that you guys know whenever you're dealing with Real Truck, you're going over to realtruck.com and looking at their products and purchasing their products, you're helping them to support uh, uh, these, uh, these groups like Tread Lightly. And I think it's really important uh, that it is, uh, you're helping indirectly uh, Real Truck support those groups. Well, if you're not familiar with Tread Lightly, you can go to their website, but they have an acronym for Tread, which is Travel Responsibly, which means looking and staying on those trails, not going off-road. Respect the rights of others so that you're not infringing on rights, as in property owners and not going where you're not supposed to. Educating yourself on what is the correct thing to do. Avoiding sensitive areas is huge, uh, especially that's what they're doing with those fencing. They're trying to protect stuff for our future and to do your part which means pack it in, pack it out, and to be able to understand what that means. So you can check that out, treadlightly.com, if you're not sure what that means. And then, of course, supporting um, Real Truck. truck. Yeah, yeah Real and, truck. And, and you guys can see this uh, this article yourself if you uh, go to jeeptalkshow.com, look for episode 1018. And uh, if, you're, if you feel adventurous, <laughs> you can go to realtruck.com slash bog and look for 3D Hill Project Easter Jeep Safari Tread Lightly. It just rolls off the tongue and the fingers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
What? Where's the noob? Noob! 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 Hey, newbie! Newbie! Noob Nugget. It's time for Newbie Nuggets. Well, if you caught episode 1014, it's hard to say that, 1014, that was a way to do Isn't it. Isn't that weird? Um, it is weird. And then in Newbie Nuggets, I was talking about actually using the spotter. This means you're sitting in the driver's seat and you're using a spotter. Um, it is kind of a two-part section because there's quite a lot to talk about. So I talked to it last week about paying attention to the spotter. Um, and when you use them, there's going to be commands that they're going to give you as far as what that you know means. That's what you kind of have to learn. Some spotters use verbal. Some others others use nonverbal commands. Both of them have pros and cons. I tend to prefer the nonverbal, um, which I'll explain in next week's episode. But we're going to talk this time about the verbal commands. Um, it's probably what's most commonly used. You can go to any YouTube video if you're trying to understand what that spotting means. And if you're a new driver, what do you need to look for? Um, and it seems that most people are pretty good at speaking their directions and most of the time drivers listen and that's kind of a key to this whole thing. But sometimes the verbal commands can get lost in translation as I call it, especially if you're a new driver and you're not familiar with what that spotter actually wants them to do. Uh, the tone of your voice is uh, important if you're giving those commands and patience, of course, is really important, especially with a new driver. Um, it's easy for verbal commands to be misinterpreted, not heard, and or confusing. So I highly recommend if you're the spotter to take the time to explain to that driver what it is that you're trying to communicate. Um, basically, verbal commands can also lend themselves to allow the driver to look away um, because if you're somebody who's barking orders and you don't connect with your driver, um, the driver may lose interest or not feel confident with you. So that's something that if you're going to be spotting to think about. So here's a couple of examples of what verbal commands might be. Um, driver, or we'll hear turn driver, basically means to turn your wheels toward the driver's side. Same with the word passenger or turn passenger. You turn the wheels toward the passenger side. Um, easy, you'll hear that a lot, sort of easy on the throttle of the brake. Um, controlling your rear is a word that I actually use sometimes when I'm teaching. Basically, when you're coming off an obstacle, you want to slow down and ease the back end off the rocks. You're not bouncing your bumper off the rocks. The word stop, very important for you to stop and freeze if you hear this command. Um, you may not have any idea what's about to happen if you don't stop. So that's super important to keep that in mind. Stop probably is universal for everybody, even in nonverbal commands. Now, the issue I have with verbal commands is that for most of the new drivers, they may not understand exactly, well, how much is driver? When I hear the word driver and I'm trying to drive, is that a little bit? Is that a lot? What does that exactly mean? And how about easy? What does that mean? So once you wheel for a bit and have several obstacles under your belt, you kind of understand what those mean. But as a spotter, being able to communicate to the driver exactly what you want them to do, it's important for that newbie success for you to let them understand what you mean by that. So for all you guys listening and you spot, think about how those verbal commands could be communicated to your newbie driver and get the most out of their experience. Um, I see this a lot with husband and wives that, that wheel together. Um, that's kind of fun to watch sometimes. I'm sorry to say that. But it's, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> but, it's, but it's kind of sad. Um, it's like you know. 90 Day Fiance or Real, live, yes. real Wives of uh, North yes. Carolina or whatever it is. <laughs> As I always say, there's some special kind of verbal communication that starts to happen. <laughs> so You just got just, on my last nerve, damn it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So just know that if the spotter loses their patience or starts to overcorrect and yelling commands, it's really not going to be beneficial for that driver. I don't care if you're new or not. So patience is super, super key. Now, the other thing I'm seeing a lot of is some spotters are using the radio to give the commands. Um, there's some pros and cons on that too. Mostly it's a con in my opinion. The time it takes the spotter to open the mic, say the command, then the driver hears the command and tries to implement the command could be the difference between staying on your line and getting stuck. Um, so there's some pros and cons on that. Sometimes you may be far away and your verbal command doesn't work because they can't hear you. I could see where there might be a possibility of using a radio. Um, we just don't usually recommend it. I don't, especially in my training. I just don't recommend using a radio. It just takes too long to get the command to that driver. Um, and if you use verbal commands, please, 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 I just said it three times, do not say the command over and over and over again. Um, 
I see that a lot too on YouTube videos. You know, driver, 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 driver. Well, <laughs> wait a minute. That's driver. Are you saying driver? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Three times. <laughs> uh, you know, it doesn't work for that that newbie driver. So please try to understand that you need to keep it down to one command. If they don't listen to you, then you know you have to do something different as a spotter. But it also by saying it once. Make sure the driver's paying attention to you mm -hmm. as the spotter. Well, I was just going to um, say, in a group of 75 spotters, which we all know happens, <laughs> <laughs> you're, doing, well, you're doing three drivers, and there's a combination yeah. of go straight mm -hmm. and uh, no. yeah. passenger so, and everything else. And what the hell's wrong with you? Listen to me. <laughs> exactly. I know. So that's the other thing I talk about is, is one, one spotter per the driver. Um, we all like to help. We all like to have an opinion, but please, they just need to hear that. So right. if you're the driver and you need to hear the command again or get clarification, definitely ask if the if the spotter said to you to do driver and you're not clear, stop and ask, Hey, can you come here? I don't understand what you want me to do. Um, that's hard to do as a newbie driver because you feel maybe somebody's watching you. You're not sure if you should say something. It's your experience. It's your vehicle. You have the ultimate command as the driver of what you want to do. So if you're not sure and you're not clear, please, please, please ask for more clarification. And spotters, please understand if that driver needs to ask you for additional help. It's not criticizing you. They're not trying to figure out, you know, what you don't know. They're just asking for more help. So it's really important. One spotter for that driver. And then the driver, please know that you use a spotter because they're your eyes and you just need one set of eyes folks <laughs> so please keep it to that so next week i'm going to get into the nonverbal commands um what i like to use and what i do and how effective it can be you as a driver can decide what you like to do and there's all kinds of spotters out there so anyway i don't continue. i don't want to ru uh, ruin your segment for next week but is any of the nonverbal eye rolling <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to share that. No, no. <laughs> I love all my drivers. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say Wendy, the one, the big one I think a spotter should ask is uh, manual or automatic. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because you know yourself, we've been out there. I've been out there with you with people with automatic versus stick, and you know you spot them differently. And well, sometimes you don't want to be standing right in front of the guy with the with the, uh, with the manual <laughs> when he launches it. Yeah. Well, and now with electric vehicles coming into play, let me tell you how different that is as a oh, spotter. Oh, wow. Because you cannot hear what they're doing with that throttle. Right. So there's a whole level of safety that has to come in. There's a whole level of understanding how that electric vehicle has great torque. Um, it God, can move. You could launch that thing, couldn't you, if yes, you're not you careful? <laughs> so there's a whole nother, yeah, I, I'll be adding that toward the end about those electrics because... Um, what we've known, all of us that have been out there, and even those of you that are more experienced and have been out a long time, you know, we really can read and hear what a vehicle's doing. I, I can tell you what a what a driver is doing with their foot, with their gears, with their thinking, because I can hear it, see it, and do it. Well, electric takes a little bit of that out of the, 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 the whole process. So, yeah, I want to hear more about that. I didn't think about that. That would be a vastly different uh, kind of experience, both for the, the driver and the spotter. Spotter really needs to be super aware when they're dealing with uh, electric of any kind because it is it puts you in a whole different light of some possibilities of some things going wrong pretty quick. So, yep. Stay tuned. Got to check out my episodes because I'm going to continue on with this series in the next couple of weeks. So Very, very cool. And see, we didn't interrupt you. And I want to say we, I mean me. We didn't interrupt well, you as much this week. <laughs> well, you, you can at any time. It's a great topic, and I love to talk about it. So I know, good. but we, we broke up your, uh, <laughs> your your episode last week and made it into two. That's but okay. Yeah, less, less to chew on, more to absorb. There you go. Welcome to Fabricating Frenzy. With Larry, also known as Jeeping Mo, whose hair is not curly. Any Mo. All right, Jeepers and everybody who works on older vehicles know that working on your own stuff is part of everyday life. But as you get into newer autos, some of these options are being taken away from you. And this is also true if you're normal day to day items as well. So I spent a little time looking into the right to repair laws. So what is right to repair and how does it affect you? Well, right to repair affects just about anything with data. 
And I was a little shocked by the way the laws had segregated into different products. Hmm. Now, it's funny how you they break out phones, computers, wheelchairs, farm equipment, and autos, each with their own right-to-repair legislation actions on them. But as this is a Jeep show, how does it affect you and your Jeep? Well, it really comes down to access into the data your Jeep produces and when it's trying to control itself and how you interact with it. A lot of times now they call it telematics. What the manufacturer is trying to force is that you have to take it to the dealer in order to to do any kind of engine control module reprogramming or adjusting. And from what I've read, they really don't want outside shops, not to mention the normal shade tree mechanic in their systems either. So basically they're trying to shut anybody out but a dealer. And if you look into this, you'll see a lot of reference to a Massachusetts legislation. It was passed in 2020 that has been updated that forces manufacturers to give basic access to the systems. So that you can work on them a little bit here and there, right? Now there are many components and modules in a car that you need access to to do some calibration or just to change component. Because a lot of times you change a component, you have to go back in there and calibrate it and do all that. Now, something as simple as a radio is a prime example that most of those are coded to your VIN number. Now, you'd be shocked to have told you that you cannot take out most radios from one vehicle to another because you have to program it to your vehicle. Now, one thing, we all use programmers like Taser Minis, JSCANs, and several others, and we just really manipulate the data that's sent out and fed back. We're really not reprogramming the system. Now, the main system is just primarily just masking. So those taser minis and all that, they're just kind of masking what you're trying to do with the increased tire size or the re-gearing and that kind of stuff. So what does all this mean? Well, the goal of the manufacturer is you must bring it back to them if you want to do any kind of repairs. Yes, you can turn all the wrenches, but if you have to access the electrical system or any of the data, well, you have to take it back to them. Now, one of the big twists of this is the Massachusetts law. And who's your like me trying to say Massachusetts all the time? It doesn't work out very well. <laughs> oh, but you're doing an okay, job. But what if you were trying to use a washer in Massachusetts? That would be really, really Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now... The Massachusetts law is forcing the right to repair was initially struck down because of the Safety Act. And the telematics in a car could be hijacked and the, dri- driver could l- you, the driver could lose all control of the vehicle. Now, if you didn't know, a lot of the newer vehicles are all steered by wire, meaning that your steering wheel is not connected to the steering box and your gas pedal is just a potentiometer potentiometer. See, there it is again, the Hoosier coming out. Volume control. (laughs) It just feeds the engine. And, you know, that all could be hijacked and you could lose all control. And that's what the, one of the big concerns is that if someone were to hack in, you could totally lose all control of the vehicle. And that's one of the big pushbacks with legislation is the reason why they don't want to give the right to repair away because they also don't want people when they're hacking into the cars causing safety issues mm-hmm. versus just tie the damp s- the, the steering wheel into the box and be done with it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I digress. Kids these days. Yeah. I remember <laughs> Josh used to go crazy with stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to everyday appliances, ironically, California has some of the better right to repair laws that I've seen. And as I said, you know, I was going to talk about SEMA. Well, the SEMA group is one of the biggest groups that are fighting for the right to repair and many other automotive legislation laws. They do much more than just have a very cool show once a year. So as as the time goes on, I plan to do a few more segments and really dive it into, you know, what does right to repair mean to you? But I think if you look into it, 
it's it's going to affect everybody's day to day life because you know, you're getting more more devices, vehicles with data, you know, with electronics, and well, eventually you're going to want to fix some of that stuff. I do not like anything having to do with restricting me from being an idiot. Um, <laughs> if I want to do something and it's dumb, then it should be my responsibility and nobody else's. Right. Uh, I understand these companies can get sued, uh, and, and it, it uh, at least from what I've seen on some of these things, it's clearly an issue from the driver uh, and not the um, uh, not the the company. What was it? Uh, I think uh, the, uh, a couple a couple of years back, uh, Jeep was being sued for the Grand Cherokees bursting into flames, mm-hmm. right? When they were hit from the rear by a vehicle doing 80, 90 miles an hour. Oh, wait a minute! You, <laughs> it's you're telling me that if you if you get hit something hard enough, it might cause a spark and burst Duh. the tank, right. and it catches on fire. <laughs> Uh, and, and these these Grand Cherokees weren't modern Grand Cherokees. They were like the uh, '90s or in the uh, early 2000s and stuff. So it's like, why why are you guys even entertaining a lawsuit for this? It's it's not designed to be able to withstand that kind of crash, and it wasn't that wasn't right. the law at the time. So, uh, but anyway, get back to my point. I want uh, vehicles are very expensive. And I do not, I mean, I'm already forced to buy liability insurance, which I think it's a good idea to have liability insurance, but I'm already forced by the government to have liability insurance. So I am being, it's being dictated to me that I have to give a company money. And, and, and that's what we're talking about here. If you're being dictated to that you can't work on this, you have to right. take it to the dealer. And in mm-hmm. newsflash, the dealer sometimes, the, and it, it may, may not be the whole dealership, it just may be the technician that's working on it, doesn't know their ass from a hole to ground. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but it, and in essence, I mean, if, you're, if you think you're buying something and you don't have total control of it, you're really just renting it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It, it goes back to, well, I mean, I don't know if, if uh, you guys are familiar with this. Uh, Adobe went from a, a, a software ownership model to a yeah. software rent model. And and right. why did they do that? Because they wanted they didn't want to come out with new product every couple of years. They could just charge you every month for it. Now they have a good cash uh, flow, and and everybody mm-hmm. wants to do that. Everybody wants to have a good cash flow. They're, you're in business to make money, so it's not a bad idea for the company. But I'm not buying Adobe products. Mm-hmm. Right. That's like I'm sorry. A lot of, I'm not renting Adobe products. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know, a, a lot of vehicles now, and I think Tesla is one of the biggest ones on this. You know, there's subscription services, depending on what you want to do with your vehicle. You know, everything's there, but if you want certain things turned on, well, now you're going to have to buy that subscription for that module. Mm-hmm. So, Including full self-driving. <laughs> including starting it, being able to drive. Right. Well, we, we've made jokes about that, too. Oh, you want your windshield wiper to fluid to come out? That's right. <laughs> to put 25 cents in the slot. That's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, and, and I'll tell you, I'm all for that for Tesla because I'm a Tesla stockholder, <laughs> but I don't own one. <laughs> so it's all about perspective, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, but no, we should always be able to, to work on our own stuff. And uh, I, I was actually telling Dan of Motobuilt at uh, EJS, I said, I think you guys, because uh, it was the, uh, um, oh, not Chupacabra, it was uh, the, the YJ that they built. And virtually the entire vehicle was built by them. There was only a little bit of actual YJ in that build. Uh, LFA, I believe is what it was. And I said, I think you guys are going a good direction here because if they keep on going, if Jeep and uh, the electrification and all that stuff going is going, we're going to have to build our own Jeeps mm-hmm. because it's not going to be a Jeep that we want. Right. And, and, and I, I think you guys are, are, are doing a good uh, positioning here because we're going to need to build our own stuff. And if we build our own stuff, uh, I mean, the government can make any law they want to, but if we're building our own stuff, it's almost like a, a kit plane, an experimental plane. Uh, we're responsible for it, and that's the way I want my vehicle to be. I want to be responsible for it. I think that I have enough smarts that I can build something where I do not need to go to uh, a dealership to have it uh, worked on. Yeah, that's why I find as I get older, I, I, I'm migrating to the older vehicles where I need three, three things, spark, fuel, air. If I can solve those, we're good. Exactly. From the mind of Nikki G. 
Hey, this is Nikki G. I just want to remind everybody to just say no to drugs. <laughs> and the fact that you were talking to drugs means that you probably have already said yes at some point or another. <laughs> well, Houston, we have a problem. I'm calling. <laughs> I'm calling to tell you that. Wendy, my lovely wife, not the lovely co-host. Although the lovely co-host could be my wife, and my wife could be the lovely co-host. I'm not picky about who's telling me I'm loading the dishwasher long, wrong. Yeah, she said she didn't really understand what cloning was all about. I just looked at her and said, yeah, that makes two of us. Hey, don't shoot the messenger. All right, boys and girls, I'll chat you later, and you have a good one. Bye. The cover joke was better. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The main event. Oh, my gosh. All right, so we're excited to announce that our next interview episode will be featuring a special guest interview uh, with Sam of Off-Road Air Buddy. You guys remember Off-Road Air Buddy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Met him. Uh, that's right. He did come to one of our Jeep events. Well, I needed to make sure he knows about the one coming up on uh, June the 8th. So uh, he's actually local uh, to me. He's in the Houston area. So it's, you know, it's it's always an hour away. Even if you're in Houston, it's Houston exactly. is an hour away. Uh, but uh, he is, uh, he's within driving distance. Uh, you can go and check out offroadairbuddy.com and keep in mind that the, 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 pa- the power is going to say power tank. The, the tank, his air tank, uh, is not their primary business. Off-Road Air Buddy is not their primary business. Uh, they uh, go and install and fill uh, the uh, CO2 at uh, bars, uh, uh, businesses, you know, restaurants, and stuff like that. That's their main business. And if I remember right, it's uh, a, a 70-year-old business. It's, it's wow. a long-time uh, business. And, uh, uh, and I've already made this, uh, this announcement. When I go to get an air tank, and I'm going to get one, I'm going to go to Off-Road Air Buddy uh, because um, uh, Sam's a great guy. He's got a good product, and uh, it's half the cost of a power tank. I love Steve. I love power tank, uh, but this guy's close. Oh, and, and when I go over there to get the air tank, it'll be filled with uh, CO2 because he'll fill it up for free. Oh, and uh, you'll like this, Larry. Uh, I can get a 50-gallon uh, a 50 uh, air tank if I want to. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Give me more shocks for that. I was just going to say, where are you going to drive that? I'll just sell it. I'll just drive yes. around. You don't need the air up? Yeah, here's the hose. <laughs> there you go. That'll be $3. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So you'll have to catch this interview on our YouTube channel. Yes, every episode that we do is on YouTube now. So you can see what you've been missing or missing what you're seeing. Uh, and, and Sam is going to show off the tank mount and accessories in the back of his Jeep in his interview, which you'll only be able to see, of course, if you're watching the interview on YouTube. All right, and our uh, what we threatened to tell you about in our must uh, must have stuff for your Jeep, uh, and and this isn't really a threat. I think this is a good thing. Uh, and I told Chris about this. Now, Chris, uh, his 2020 Gladiator that he uh, that he bought uh, traded in the JK, got a 2020 Gladiator. He's really excited, and really happy with it. Uh, he does not have the Mopar uh, trail system, uh, trail mount system, like like I, mine didn't either. So I bought that off of uh, uh, off of Amazon, installed it. Super easy to install that. And uh, once that was installed, I was able to put a high lift uh, jack bed mount for the Gladiator in there because you have to have that. Uh, I don't know if you have to have. It's I think it is designed for the Mopar uh, trail system, uh, but. Uh, the, it, it may work with others. I mean, specifically, they don't specifically say that you have to have that uh, for uh, in this uh, Amazon link uh, that I'm uh, going to provide you here in the in the show notes. But the uh, high lift uh, jack bed mount for the Jeep Gladiator 2020 Plus, it's seventy three dollars and forty five cents. It mounts uh, to the Mopar Trail Rail system, uh, and uh, I have uh, this mount thanks to High Lift. Uh, they sent it to me, and it's made it through trips to Hidden Falls. And two Easter Jeep safaris. Uh, cool. It's very solid and no noise. And this Yay. is this is a testament That's to the, the yeah. This is a testament to the the, the Mopar uh, trail system as well. But mm-hmm. uh, it it just it's just there. Now it does come with uh, two um, not really thumb screws, but uh, you guys can see it in the show notes here. Uh, it, it, the, the the twist ons that hold it in place. And mm-hmm. you may notice that the one up front looks different than the one in back. The one yeah. that's closest to the camera. Four-sided versus three. Yeah, so that three-sided one is actually a lockable one. So yeah, you want I, that? <laughs> yeah, I bought that in addition uh, mm-hmm. to this uh, this setup because I wanted to be able to lock it in place. Now, now when I go to use it, I'll have to try to remember what damn key it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I can 
That well, that should be on your key ring. Yeah, absolutely. But which key is it? So you're wow. trying all of them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully it's not an emergency. Uh, but uh, yeah, this actually this whole thing that you're seeing, I just asked them if they wouldn't mind sending me the uh, the mount, and they wound up sending me the the high lift, the cover. Uh, and the mount, uh, and gee, wow. it seems like something else they 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 sent me on there as well. But uh, super nice, and uh, it's there and it's ready to go. And with the, the locking uh, thing, which is also a high lift uh, deal, uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm more assured that it will still be there. I mean, you see the the bolts holding it to the uh, um, to the trail rail system. You could mm -hmm. just you could just unscrew those and take it with you. And then work on the lock later. But at least it's you know all all security is a matter of it. inconvenience. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what you want. Slow it down. Yeah. So I really like it. It's great. It's out of the way. Uh, I have a, a bed cover, so it is uh, covered from the uh, from the elements uh, and the all the the massive amount of dust, which I don't know that that's necessarily bad for high lift, but it didn't get any dust on it from EJS. So it's there. It's ready to go, and I'm probably going to be able to count on it being there when I need it. So uh, yeah, I think it's a great. Set up and high lift. The high lift just makes great stuff. You, you can't go wrong with a high lift. Oh, no, I got a good product. I got to mention this. Do you guys know Chris Collard? Do you know who he is? Gone Jeeping, uh, a lot oh, of publications, yes. magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, Chris Collard, I went on a Gone Jeeping uh, deal with Greg and Chris. Uh, Chris Collard and uh, uh, Rick Payway was on that as well. Anyway, uh, so uh, Chris was actually leading uh, the adventure, and he's got a uh, a jack on the front of his. God, it's like a CJ5 or something. I'm, I'm not really knowledgeable on older Jeeps. And we were just standing there talking, and uh, I, I pointed to the to the uh, the jack on there, the, which which I, I was sure it was a high lift. But I, I asked him, I said, uh, so is that a Harbor Freight uh, jack you got on there? <laughs> he goes, screw you. Exactly. <laughs> Making <laughs> friends. So if you don't know, you don't want to get one of those uh, cheaper non-high lift jacks. If you're going to get it... You know, I, the high lift is going to be upset with me. But high lift jacks are dangerous enough as they are. Don't get a knockoff. Get the Correct. get the the original one. And Spend the money. It's yeah, worth it. Yeah, and, and I think you guys agree with this too. Don't get the the uh, Harbor Freight or whatever nope. fly by night uh, jack manufacturer is farm jack right. manufacturers out there. Nope. All right, well, thanks for listening to this episode of the Jeep Talk Show. If you've enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. You know, I read that, and that's when I remember I should go and check out the Apple reviews. Have you guys done an Apple re review recently? I mean, I, I need to go ch have a look. And uh, we, we don't want nothing, no no flowery thing. I mean, if you believe that, that's fine. But you can put anything you like in there. And, and actually, we kind of have some fun with the negative reviews. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we like to he have your feedback. Also, don't forget to find us on Instagram and sign up for our email newsletter to stay up to date with the latest news, uh, Jeep news uh, events, and how to join our roundtable uh, uh, recording every Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. It's a Zoom meeting. It's really easy. Uh, and uh, the newsletter will remind you weekly about that. Finally, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. Go to jeeptalkshow.com uh, slash contact to find your multiples, or to find your multiple ways, to find multiple ways to contact us. You know, I, the words are right there, and I just kind of, I just kind of go off on my own. <laughs> I'm, it's I'll, rubbing I'll, off on I, you. I'm wandering <laughs> around while I'm, uh, while I'm reading. <laughs> Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Jeep Talk Show. Broadcasting since 2010. You're my friend. You're my new friend. <laughs> <laughs> no audio, Larry. I'm not getting any audio from you. Nothing. Oh, I think I heard something there at the end. This is my fault for asking him to adjust his microphone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess if I wasn't on mute, I would be okay. <laughs> Hey. Just a sec. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. It, that happens oh to God. me a lot of times. I'll be talking to you guys, trying to figure out why I can't hear you, and I've well, it's muted on the on the the poor, mixer. Poor Larry, 
Larry's having a complete fall apart over there. I'm sorry. Let's blame it on Duke. Did he pull the cord? I love blaming it on Duke. The uh, mount just fell into the trash can. Oh, yeah. That happens to me. I have to tighten mine up occasionally. I have Wait, to are, I have to look at for the leans. Uh, are, actually, are, are we are we still recording on YouTube? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, this well, is great. Well, it's not. We're not on YouTube, but uh, we're recording the video, audio, and video. Right. But you, can you do this out or can leave it in there? I probably edit it out. Um, okay. Uh, I, I I mean I think it's funny and stuff, but I hate uh, I hate um, making fun of somebody else besides myself. I know it's hard. Oh, yeah. I'm okay. <laughs> He's like, dang it, Dick. It fell into the sock void. <laughs> and Larry, take don't don't rush. Take your time. I, I mean, it. it's I fine. It. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Larry. Oh, we've all been there. It's crazy stuff. I like it best when it happens to Josh, though, because you know Josh is just like <laughs> a perfectionist about stuff. So uh, that's what I'd be. I'd be more worried about. Oh no, I can't believe I'm holding everybody up. Yeah, you know that's that's the st- okay. that's why I always say take your time, don't worry about it, because uh, yeah. it's uh, I know I, I hate it whenever there, I have a technical issue and I'm holding you guys up. Yeah, it's all right. All right, better. Well, yes. we'll see if it stays. The mount stays up, but yes, <laughs> I can, we can hear you. Love it. Love uh, it. All right, so uh, let's take about a, a five second pause, and then you do do yours, Larry, and I'll just uh, uh, cut it in the the video. <laughs> 